leader of the government, there is still this Trumpism that exists in this country and that it's going to require a level of alertness and uh, an attentiveness that isn't fun unnecessarily, but we'll make it fun at CBST, right, Harold? We're right. going to make so it fun at CBST. We're, we're at time. I will tell everybody that your New Year's resolution should be at least this week on Thursday, if you can, go to Resistance Calls and Cards online with the new president of our synagogue, Sabrina Farber, and exactly what the rabbi is saying, the first thing that she will help you do is to identify every single one of your elected representatives and how to get a hold of them. And she has a weekly action that you can do. Um, so if I could jump in. Yes, let me just say, Harold, before we go to the, we go to this. So we're, today we are going to go to the personal offerings for Psalm 14. But tomorrow, unfortunately, because of an appointment, I couldn't switch. Class is going to be at 9 a.m., not at 10 a.m., and again, I'll be on at 8.45-ish. The class will open just for tomorrow. We know some people won't be able to make it and we're sorry, but it's just, there's, there was nothing I could do to get around this. So tomorrow's class, which will be a continuation of the readings of our offerings for Psalm 14 will be at 9 a.m. Okay, everybody? Right, we sent, we sent out an email and Annika, let's all give a cheers to Annika has been juggling everyone. So the people who can't be here tomorrow, we will hopefully be able to get them to read today. And then tomorrow will be the people who can be there early. And I feel comfortable. I feel I feel relatively confident that if we start right now, we can get through everything in the next two days. And then Wednesday, we will start on Psalm 15. So with your permission, Rabbi, I would like yes. to start our offerings with Dean Dresser with another beautiful image. Dean. Dean, are you here? Hi, yes. Um, well, you all know my language. So um, this is about the dinner plate, of course, with uh, meat in their teeth. But uh, it just, this is lamentation so that all of them are circling. And then there is um, the circle of the presence. Um, around it um, and our speaker if you go to the lower right hand side you can see our speaker um, who's commenting for the psalm 14. so that's all i have to say rabbi it, it's beautiful dean and can you talk a little bit about this seems am i wrong and again it'd be lovely to see it in comparison more white space um the white, space is, um, the white space is organized circularly around this embedded uh, self-devouring as uh -huh. um, has told us. Uh, I kept thinking about a dinner plate and about uh -huh. the idea of meat on the teeth and so on and so forth. Beautiful. But it's also a world uh, unto themselves. Uh, we wish only evil people would have a world unto themselves. But yes. anyway... Um, the circling white space is, is that, it's a presence and it hoovers humanity edges, which has to do also with my uh, sense of um, God is present with us through all. Um, Beautiful. Bad and the ugly. Beautiful, Dean. And I have to say, having seen the video that you and Harold made together, it really affects my seeing this. So I really appreciate that. Beautiful. All right, we will now move on to the written offerings. And please, Annika is in chat. This will work best if everybody is ready to go and unmuted when I call on you. So we have our Psalm 14 offerings, the people who asked, who told us that they could only be available today. Um, we have done Dean. We are now at Judy Frank. <clears throat> I don't know. I we warned you, we told you, Adam was a crazy idea. Oops, sorry, sorry, go ahead. He would become evil, destroy Hold everything. on just a second, we don't have the, uh, we're still looking at Dean. Okay, let me pull this up again. Thank you for letting me know, Rabbi. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm reading from my own email. Yes. Yeah, so hold on just a second, Judy. Can we see there this? There we go, we see okay. it now, we see it now. Thank you, Harold. <clears throat> Adonai, we warned you, we told you, Adam was a crazy idea. He would become <laughs> evil, destroy everything. He would act as if you were dead, 
greedy for control of everything, destroy your creations, even their garden planet, hate their brothers, even their mothers, you insisted, and they wait for rescue, and you forgive them and still love them. When they love you again and beg for your help, you will try to help them again. Um, Beautiful. Well, that was me from the angel's uh, point of view, uh, berating God, but they know that God loves uh, humanity and will always try to help us. And uh, when we had the Havaruta uh, talking about the Psalm, um, Joan and I, I think that's her first name, <laughs> I keep screwing up first names, were believing that there is always one good person on the earth, that you know, we disagreed with that everyone was evil. So, um, so that's why, and I sort of believe at the end that um, I have this cartoon hanging up from um, a cartoon that says, uh, our arms are the only arms that God has to hold us with. Hold uh -huh. us. So that's what I believe is sort of like hopeful at the end. Let's see, dark. Try. Well, I, I love the idea of doing this from the voice of the angels. And there's such a tension in Jewish life, you know, between angels and humanity that angels are uh, are not able to achieve what we can do because they don't have the arms, as you know, and they don't have the flesh. So they don't have both the strength and the... And so it's fascinating to see this psalm from that point of view. And, you know, they call this... Um, it's a very reconstructionist theology, which is that we can't know God, but we could just know God's actions in the world. So we can see humanity who acts God-like. So we know God kind of as a verb. We could act in a holy way. We can act godly, but we can't ultimately know God. So this is a beautiful expression of that and that belief in that. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Now, Michael Goldstein. I'm here. Uh, I just uh, uh, want to thank Rabbi Kleinbaum for clarifying King David for me. So um, I'm going to read this and then I'll discuss why I did it this way. It's a wisdom psalm and the poet says, for David, king of the Jews, and I would just say for David, a king of the Jews, uh -huh. <laughs> the fool believes there is no good. Human accomplishments uh -huh. are distractions. None are worthwhile. From on high, the greatest good views humanity and searches for a person of enlightened common sense, a person aware of goodness. Everyone is corrupt, loathsome. None do good. The world is bad. Don't they know these makers of inequity eating at humanity as if gorging at meals that they never seek the good? Consequently, they are besieged by fear because the good exists in the realm of justice. You may ignore the advice of the lowly, but goodness is human salvation. Oh, that the redemption of Israel would emanate from the Holy Temple Mount's congregation. When goodness returns to humanity, Jacob will rejoice and Israel will be fulfilled. Michael, uh, okay. Harold, I'm not sure how much time we have. Can the authors speak as well? Yes, yes we... certainly. Okay. The authors get to get a minute and you get a minute. And okay, I great. We're just trying, we're trying our new system. So I want to make sure. So Michael, do you want to say anything about writing this from Psalm 14? Yes, I, I was, uh, I researched Zion and uh -huh. that's the Holy Temple Mount. So that took me back to King David and what the wisdom of this Psalm refers to. And that, uh, uh, oh, that redemption of Israel would emanate from the Holy Temple Mount's congregation. Mm -hmm. uh, we can translate that in today's terms that it's an advertisement for congregations worldwide. In other words, that's why we have synagogues is to have congregations locally. Uh -huh. And that we uh, can uh, redeem Israel and goodness will return to humanity within congregation. And Michael, I have to say, it's kind of dashing your uh, eye patch. Oh, that's dashing. Forget it. I have macular degeneration. Oh, God. Well, the eye patch looks very dashing. Sorry about the macular degeneration, though. So I think this, your use of good for God throughout your exploration of the Psalms really works beautifully in this Psalm. Because to say the fool believes there is no good 
that's an expression of what God would be. And I like that. And I think it works beautifully here to say that human accomplishments are distractions and none are worthwhile is really a sense of hopelessness that the psalm embodies and you're rejecting it. And that's why, because the Temple Mount is Mount Zion, that's the name of that, of the, it's actually the mount right next to it. That's why Zion is often used throughout the Bible to refer to Jerusalem as a whole, because that mountain is in Jerusalem. So it can mean either the mountain ex itself, which is, this is a perfect uh, understanding of it, or it can be a, another word for Jerusalem itself, meaning the center of God's presence in biblical religious life, which makes even more sense that there needs to emanate from there holiness to all places. So, and it's, it's easy to understand what we mean by God when we read your Psalm, when goodness returns. That, when good, we could all relate to that, right? When we see goodness, aren't we gonna rejoice and feel fulfilled? That's all we're asking for. It's beautiful, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank There's you. some lovely comments in chat particularly you are moving us all towards thinking of God as good or the good. Thank you. Thank you. Donna, Donna, is, it, is it possible to make these slightly larger or is that let me try, let it's me, too let me, difficult? Don't worry, but uh, I'll manage uh, it. It, 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 it. It is. It just becomes a little. Okay, here we go. Better? Yeah, that is better. Thanks. Donna Gray. What is going on in this world? Oh, God, my God, it is so disheartening. Loathsome scoundrels, wait, loathsome scoundrels who care nothing about what is right continue playing their dirty tricks. Contorting themselves into pretzels, they scheme and lie in futile attempts to hold on to power they honestly lost. They claim that election deceit was so deceitful it couldn't be detected. Yet their own devious deceptions are plain for all to see. With efforts to turn lawmakers and law enforcers into lawbreakers, they threaten the very foundations of our society. All in the name of what? If so-called leaders had been more concerned with the general good than their own TV images, hundreds of thousands might still be alive today, but they don't care. Raw power to fulfill their own evil ambitions is all that matters to them. They think you don't see, but you do, through the eyes of every decent person committed to truth. If you can only do for us what you can do through us, please shine a light to guide our weary souls out of this labyrinth of darkness. Dear maestro in the sky, We've turned the page on a catastrophic year. Now, enough of this doom and gloom. Please play us an upbeat tune. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Don, say, so say a few words, Donna, about writing this from Psalm 14. Um, you know, like so much of it, when I first read the Psalm, it was just um, so, you know, I use the word disheartening here, you know, like when people say everything, you know, no, there's no one is good, everyone is horrible. But, you know, like we all have the possibility to be either horrible or good. Um, and, you know, like, I, but, but in this case, like I just, you know, I'm just so disheartened by what's going on in this world in this in our country in the politics of it and yeah. i listened to the entire uh uh trump telephone call to to georgia please yeah really this is criminal yeah this is Anna, you know, what you've done here which i love and you you'll hear me say this over and over again and by the way like with michael i can see the themes in your Psalms developing beautifully. So now you're even more fluent in the structure and the, so to say what is going on in this world is a perfect opening to a Psalm. What is going on? There's sense of, you know, frustration, anger, despair. It's just all of that there very directly. And you're, and oh God, my God, it is so disheartening. You're so personal, so vulnerable. And then you go through as Psalm 14 does describe 
what are the loath lo loathsome scoundrels? How terrific is that as an expression of what we've seen of Ra, bad people, Rasha, evil people, or enemies, loathsome, loathsome scoundrels. And this description of what we understand to be evil in our world, <coughs> all in the name of what? So what I like there is I see the question mark. You have what is going on in the world, a description of the evil, all in the name of what? Just very powerful. And, um, but they don't care. Again, there's the short verses. I like the, the formatting very much. And then you end with what I think is our religious challenge. They think you don't see, but you do through the eyes of every decent person committed to truth. If you can only do for us, dear maestro in the sky. So I love that reference back to Lamanat Seach or the original superscription. We've turned the page on a catastrophic year. Now enough of this gloom and doom. Please play us an upbeat tune. Going back to the music theme of what we understand in the Psalms. Beautiful, Donna, really beautiful. I started out with the end and then I, I didn't know where to go. Uh -huh. So I put the, the beginning at the end. Uh -huh. And then that makes sense to me because we all talked about how that last stanza didn't make, you know, was so different and so, but do you see the difference in yours makes sense? It's like, oh, you after you've outlined the evil, so to speak, and after you've expressed the despair, then maybe there's room for some aspirational hope and for to be able to ask for something else, which is for our souls to be able to rest and to, for there to be an upbeat tune. And sometimes it takes living through that the, those feelings of the beginning of the psalm to get to the place of the bottom of the psalm. May Wednesday go by without consequence, and may January 20th arrive soon. Yeah, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> and may tomorrow bring good news from Georgia. Yes. Right. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you, Donna. And look in the comments, your beautiful comments. Barbara. Yes, thank you. Is God dead or only unseen by the wrongdoers who think they can do whatever they want and their transgressions will not be seen? She, being omnipotent, sees and hears everything. They are seen at the dinner table as they eat with their blood-stained hands, food in their teeth. They feel they are victorious as we cry. They are unaware as they chew everything around them. They are unaware of our pain, thinking only of themselves. They are unaware that they are being seen by God. She witnesses their actions. She listens to us. She remembers, she lives. Wow. Wow. So tell us a little bit about writing this, Barbara. <laughs> you know, I was having a lot of trouble with Psalm 14. And, and I, I even said, I have a lot of other things going on. And I said, I may not do this one. And then I couldn't help myself. <laughs> so I started, instead of looking at there is no God, or like Bernstein says, God is dead. I thought, well, if I make it a question, and I really started with, is God dead? And then it just started flowing the way it is. I mean, the pen, the pen was in my hand and I don't even know where it came from, but it says everything that I want to say. And I definitely wanted to make God female. So uh -huh. I did that as well. And that's why that the paragraph where she being omnipotent is by itself. So it stands out and you can see it. Mm -hmm. um, it just flowed. I didn't spend a lot of time on it. I didn't, uh -huh. then I went back and changed certain words uh -huh. and certain things. And I wanted it to look a certain way. Yeah. You know, when I first started writing at Psalm 11, I had no idea of structure uh -huh. or anything. And it's, it's come where I like, it should be vis visually pleasing as well as the words having meaning. Yeah. So. Well, I think you're finding your Psalm voice. You know, I think you're fine. Cause I think this is a beautiful, and I think to struggle with this, this is a great um, commentary on the first couple of lines, uh, especially the first sentence verse, but the couple of lines of Psalm to say, is God dead or only unseen by the wrongdoers who think they can do whatever they want? Like, is that what right. that means? And I think that's a perfect expression of what it could mean. And you're really understanding one very, very powerful way to read that verse. Because what does it mean if these evildoers say there's no God? It means they think there's no consequences, right? They think they can get exactly. away. They think there's no... So you've expressed that beautifully. And I love that you went, uh, used the female for God. 
and I and I like and I and I see that many of you are doing this is exploring this whole idea of being at the dinner table and what with food mm -hmm. in their teeth they feel they are victorious as we cry, they are unaware as they chew everything around them, and that really is the definition of sociopath, right? No empathy, no awareness of another's feeling, and you really have this image of just <laughs> people at a medieval at a medieval banquet table you know ripping the leg off of a pig and just you know and <laughs> right <laughs> that was good i like that it's a very strong image very very strong image thank you thank you laurie croatman <sighs> who cares anyway your silence is so loud your gaze is so blinding your heartbeat so thunderous is everyone repulsive, unlovable, pitiful, disgusting? I feel that way sometimes. Why bother when my mind spirals, my eyes fail, my heart shatters? I lose my balance and totter on the precipice, cling to the railing to stop from tumbling down, down, down. I do not think you have been particularly good to me that is not your job. I need to see beyond myself to regain equilibrium. Mm. So talk to us a little bit. Well, um, I just, I, I couldn't bring myself, you know, out of feeling negative with this psalm. And, you know, I do feel that this way. I don't feel it this second, but as I read it, it brings back up when I feel this way. And mm -hmm. sometimes I go from bubbly optimism to deep despair without, you know, A to Z, without stopping anywhere. And the bottom line is that I just have to be, I've said this in so many of my Psalms, they just have to be wherever I am yeah. and see beyond my, myself, my ego, my suffering. And that's the only way I can regain my equilibrium and I think that's the only way the world can really regain its equilibrium be where you are it doesn't mean you don't take action yep. um, but don't react take action and and move forward it's the only way I can pull myself out of despair when I feel that way well this is really beautiful and you've really turned the psalm into both this and I'll, again I like the formatting very much and you could see that in the in the, the structure, the way you've written it and your uh, response, but be, the be, ability to be able to express this kind of despair and sadness and loneliness that it causes, and also to push through to a place of, okay, well, what, what can I, who can I be in this moment besides just a bundle of despair and loneliness and depression? Okay, all of that is true and we have to accept it. But I think there is this question of, uh, you know, that God wants us to always ask ourselves, what can I learn at this moment about myself, about the world, who I can be? And I think if we're able to open ourselves enough up, we'll find that there are important things that we have to learn from every moment, including moments of terrible suffering. And all those things that we learn help us, I believe, to be closer to that which is the holy in the universe. Right. And uh, I think you've expressed it in a way that I find very meaningful. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Linda Solomon. Yes, here I am. Just one word before I start. Uh, I'm an outsider looking in. Okay. For the conductor, is that you, David? Hmm. I do not know who is conducting the orchestra. All I can say is that the conductor needs a little help. <laughs> who is making the decisions about good and evil sounds in the world? Who has the right to judge? Is it only the poor with their tin cans and boxes who can replicate the music to please God, David? You know, the hallelujah. And the unpoor, with their glorious instruments, are they always the evil doers? Do not the poor sometimes make bad decisions, even flat sounds? 
I guess the conductor thinks they can all be led astray because our conductor is saying that there is no one, not one, who has not gone blind to the sweet music, whose instrument does not sound sour in the ears of the maestro. The music and the instruments of the poor are devoured by the evildoers, and the sound they make is raucous and cacophonous. It is deafening, and even the unpoor are afraid. They know they are not making pure sounds, exultant sounds to the one on high. Therefore, they spew out the tin cans and boxes, throw down their instruments, and try to listen. But the conductor begs the maestro, please show us all the way. And the maestro bellows, make pure music, sweet, pleasing sounds. You remember David, the hallelujah. They all hear the voice. They all, poor and unpoor alike, pick up their instruments and try to play together. Slowly they begin to make beautiful harmony, a song so thrilling it must be pleasing to the maestro. The conductor cries, no longer seeking redemption to come from Jerusalem. For the conductor finally hears it while the orchestra plays on. Hallelujah. Wow. You too. I just see such great development in everybody's psalm writing. Really. Linda, beautiful. Tell us a little bit about Thank it. Thank you. Well, it struck me that we've been talking so much about the fact that most of these psalms were musically inclined. They, they were meant to be sung or whatever. And so I, the first thought that came to me was to do it into a chorus, but I couldn't do it in a chorus. It had to be an orchestra. Uh -huh. So I chose to use the theme of an orchestra and to make the maestro God uh, or good, Michael, and uh -huh. the conductor possibly David, and of course, I have some leaning towards um, Leonard Cohen here. Mm -hmm. so, well, I think it's a great perspective. And like some of the others, I love that you've used an unusual perspective and an unusual way to get at the, to try and understand, understand the underlying, some of the underlying themes and messages. Right, um, I, and I found it interesting that Don and I both used the word maestro uh-huh. And um, that we both uh, used this theme, this musical theme. And of course, I had to take the last um, verse and do something a little different with it. So, you know, it, it had to be the conductor who was seeking the redemption from Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you're reflecting it's such an interesting also concept, the relationship of conductor to musicians or to singers, right? What's the relationship? And similar to the way you're describing here, uh, you're using this, um, uh, uh, that the instrument does not sound sour in the ears of the maestro, that the maestro's ability to bring out the good in everyone, uh, you know, is a power that's pretty profound. And on the other hand, uh, the evildoers make a sound that's raucous and cacophonous and deafening. And uh, it's really, it's a really, I love this theme and I love the way you played it out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. And now we have Scott Soloway. <clears throat> Unwitting, one reasons with oneself that there is no purpose, that there is no one watching people thus spoil and encourage abomination. No one acts purely for good. Hashem looks over creation, seeking one with insight, one who seeks a purpose, seeking the one. We all can turn away knowing everything comes to an end. Together, we become tainted, saying again, no one, no one acts purely for good. Don't you know? We enact our sorrow, consuming our people like we sink our teeth into a plump roll, 
without a blessing. It is there that mortal fear seizes us. Purpose accompanies a tzaddik. Yet we find ourselves disparaging that lowly idea of finding refuge in the one. Who will give salvation? In the one returning and our return, we can rejoice in who we have been and exult in who we are becoming. Hmm. Wow, Scott, talk to us. Well, um, I was trying to, I was struggling with the first line, thinking about what it means when the Naval says, Ein Elohim. Um, and so I thought about it in diff several different ways, one of which was sort of a question of what is our purpose? What is the purpose in life? What is it? Who is sort of guiding us? Who's the master of the universe? All of those kinds of things. And, and to, in, in my day-to-day -day world, I think about that in, to some degree as purpose. What is our purpose? Uh -huh. Um, and so I started with, started there, um, and, uh, you know, tried to see how the Psalm tells us something about that. And in the end, I always struggle with when we, they talk about Yaakov and Israel, um, and I was thinking about the, 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 um, uh, the, the Torah portions of the last couple of weeks and, and about that name and how it goes to back and forth between Jacob and Israel. Um, and I was trying to think of it uh, as Yaakov being part of our past and Israel being what we can become or who we can be. And that's how I thought about the last line. Uh-huh. This is, there's a... Um famous rabbi who's uh, Allah Shalom, not alive and I've forgotten his name from California who uh, oh, what was his name Lou L-E-W oh, I can't remember but he <clears throat> in one of his books he talks about the idea what if we functioned as if <clears throat> Alan Lou thank you Marsha Melnick Alan Lou right <clears throat> what if we functioned as if the tape were always running in other words we were always on camera, so to speak. We're always being watched, you know, not in a creepy, you know, big brother way, but in a God, the one who cares about us sees everything as opposed mm. to the no one, the contrast to what we're, what you have in the beginning, you know, of not being seen, of not being known, uh, you know, that one reason that there's no purpose, there's no one watching and no one acts purely for good. And then this contrast with, well, Hashem looks over creation, seeking one with insight, seeking one who seeks purpose, seeking the one. So this is very interesting because your perspective here is not that the Naval, Naval is somebody outside. Right. So you're looking at this with a very good, a very interesting perspective that's, on, that's kind of tw helping us have one other access to the Psalm, which is what about this part of all of us who is the Naval, who doesn't who's the loathsome scoundrel. We all can be the loathsome scoundrel, so to speak. Um, so that's beautiful. We find ourselves disparaging that lowly idea of finding refuge. Who will give salvation? The one returning in our return. We can rejoice in who we have been and exult in who we are becoming, which is really a reflection of the other Psalm we just read, which is about we have to be where we are. Yes. We will find... It's possible to just accept who we are, where we are, even while we're exalting in who we'll become. I think that sums up a religious uh, life beautifully, that we have to really deeply love ourselves exactly where we are and have aspirations for where, how much farther we can grow and become. Beautiful. Thank you. All right. So Alan Liu is, uh, wrote, now I can't, Marsha, maybe you'll remember the name of his books. One of our interns worked for him as an assistant rabbi for a couple of years, but he writes a lot of books very influenced by Eastern uh, Buddhism and meditation. And I've forgotten the name of his books, but they're very worthwhile to read because they reflect this very idea of how do we be fully present and also be open to change. And that's the, that is the deepest question of Yom Kippur, which I try to speak about every year in different ways, 
because it's the same challenge to us as human beings all the time. How do we deeply accept who we are and where we are and also believe that we can become better? Rabbi, isn't there a book called This Is Real and something like you have no idea what's Yes, that's going Alan Lou. That's Alan Right, Lou. that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't But I don't have it exactly. There, Lori just posted it. That's it's a wonderful book for high holiday preparation. And this challenge, this is what the challenge is, right? Because we human beings, we tend to get sunk into we're bad, we're so we're so bad, we're you know, that it's very hard to believe we can do the transformational work of becoming better. If you feel really bad about yourself, it's very hard to want to change, really, to have the energy to change. And if you feel too good about yourself in an arrogant, narcissistic way, you don't think you have to change, right? Donald Trump does not think he has to improve. That, that's, one of the, that's one of the diseases of narcissism. So how do we get to, but most of us suffer from the opposite, that think that deep down we're, you know, uh, we're not good enough. So how do we, believe, we have to, most of us have to get to the place of believing exactly who we are is absolutely good enough. And we can do better, both of those things. Very few of us are in the, are in the spot of we're so good we don't need to, uh, we don't need to improve. That's, in my experience of decent humanity, that's far fewer of us, how shall we say. Most of us struggle with uh, a sense that we're not good enough. And Yom Kippur is about telling us that we are good enough and we can be better. God loves us exactly as we are and God believes in our ability to, be, uh, to improve at the same time. So I don't know if that, uh, if that uh, me, uh, resonates for folks, but Alan Liu, that's a good book to read. And it's a great, I read it uh, every few years, preparation for Rosh Hashanah. I don't, honestly, I don't read it every year, but it's a very, it's a great, it's a great book. If you like this general perspective, he has other books as well. Um, unfortunately, he died pretty young. Uh, anyway, so, okay, Sherry. So following on that theme, <laughs> um, not one does good, inspired by Psalm 14. In the whole, solitary, some scuffle, one guard, a violation. One more year added to a sentence spelled without words. After a beach walk, bitter. Here's how winds whip, I scan an angry sea, often's crossing, none. Seagulls overtake one another, steal, then devour hapless crabs. Schooner wrecked, manila three-inch, three-strand, Kevlar snake, twisted spine tossed near screeching gulls. yellow bottom fishing baskets strewn, gaping, empty. Beached sail red and white striped corpse, engine cracked. Not one boat floats, just scraps from this sea vessel broken apart, unworthy of salvation. Breakers of tears flood my deck, no one saved. Mm. But today, becalmed, I clutch one weathered wheel on a flat sea. It whispers where the fish troves are. Nets cast. I need just wait. Wow. Sun glimmers on water. I hoist aboard a solitary hope for salvation. Wow. Devastating, powerful, powerful. Sherry, speak to us a little bit. Well, um, it loosely follows the arc of Psalm 14 with desolation, despair, bleakness, uh, which happened to be my mood at the time. Um, here in the natural world is bitter winds and angry seas and uh, Psalm 14 search for a righteous person. Uh, here at the beach, you search for dolphins because they appear almost miraculously at times. And, and this uh, moment, fractious seagulls devouring crabs, paralleling the evildoers devouring 
people and the works of evildoers. Here is this vessel that we found, wreckage, not the whole vessel, found on the beach, a symbol of emotional wreckage found in the poem's beginning. Um, and then the poems end like the psalm does, on a boat stored with faith in at least promise of salvation. That is a very beautiful image. Sun glimmers on water, the water which is both scary and dangerous and beautiful and glorious. I hoist aboard a solitary hope for salvation. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the best we can do. Just beautiful. And I think you're, as you've described, the natural world being this kind of scary place in the moment. And it's also full of this spectacular beauty. Breakers of tears flood my deck. Very, very powerful. You're an amazing writer, Sherry. We're so lucky to have you in the class. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Sherry, you have Goldilies to read, correct? I sent it to you? Yes, I do. And Gold Sherry, Lee. thank you for being uh, our reader for others. I just want to make sure Goldilies, I believe, is calling in. Goldilies, are you with us? If you could unmute yourself and let us know. Goldilies? Yeah. Oh, okay. Goldilies here, so Sherry, you could go ahead. Is yud He vav He with us? Are we with yud He vav He? A Psalm 14 and O come, O come, Emmanuel, reply. Interesting. Come on, come on, O Israel. You know there's no Emmanuel. Come on. The con man's everywhere. They're evil. Your breath's only air. Recoil, recoil, Emmanuel. Shan't come to thee, O Israel. No one who sees nor hears your kind and patient flailing pious cries. Nor one who's witnessed from above save scoundrels who prey on fool's love. Recoil, recoil. Emmanuel can't come to thee, O Israel. How come? Oh God, I feel you're there. Your love is real and melts despair. Though power over caused strife, our empowered active prayers unite. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel is here with thee, we Israel. Wow. And this with some rhyming going on here. Beautiful. We haven't had a lot of that. Great. Godali, would you talk to us a little bit about it? Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Um, I, for some reason, I kept hearing that hymn, which is one of my favorites. And I know that Emmanuel means, um, I learned from my Christian wife, it means God is with us um, in, in Isaiah. Um, having nothing to do with the, the meaning in the later hymn, I just follow the um the rhythm and the rhyme and the form which um i just enjoyed doing because it it, it surprised me but it reminded me of speaking to this in a cynical voice and then in a rejoicing voice of the idea of psalm 14 of god and god is here is always um both aspirationally and what i like to believe and feel that god is always here with us it's are we with God. Yeah, I love the contrast before, between the first uh, couplet and the last one uh, that you start out, come on, come on, O Israel, you know there's no Emmanuel, and then you end with rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel is here with thee, we Israel. I love that. And you know, the whole book of um, the five books of Moses, the, the, uh, the, the T of Tanakh, Torah of Tanakh, ends with the word Israel as a message, I believe always, that ultimately it's about the general population. It's not about the big leaders. It's not about the uh, who's in charge, whether it's Moses and much of the book of the books of, of Moses or Joshua and the coming books. And so to have this as the ending really uh, echoes back to that for me, really beautiful. And I love this. Oh. Yep, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Thank you. No, thank you. I, I, you know, that's so beautiful. And I actually learned that after I wrote it, Rabbi, because that was my intent. So that was really cool. So thank you for um, 
emphasizing that because that was a beautiful, oh good, you know, unconscious thing. Thank you. And I love, and I love here for Naval or your understanding of what the evil person is, or or as we've talked about, Naval has a lot of understandings, or the not necessarily evil, but the uh, how did we have we translated in so many different ways, uh, my degenerate or scoundrel or to say yeah. con man, which is so relevant to us today, right? Con men. Yes. Is everywhere, this feeling that we're surrounded by con men. Beautiful. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And the opening question is Yudhe Vavhe with us? Or are we with Yudhe Vavhe? Beautiful. So Thank for you. Last, so the last. Question, is, it, is it singable? Have you tried singing it with, you know, with the music of uh, um, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel? Well, that's how I wrote it, at singing it, actually. Oh, and I, I, so that would be, that's it, pretty fantastic. It, it matches it, it for that, that I, um, so, yeah, thank you. So you fun to it, try to do I one thought day. about singing it goatily, and then I decided not to. <laughs> uh, no, that was too much to ask, Sherry. You read it beautifully. Thank you. <laughs> Sherry has a beautiful singing voice. Sherry, give us the first verse, just so that we can hear it. Maybe a then. couple. Can you do it? Yes. I have to get the uh, the melody in my brain again. Go to Lee. Go to Lee. Oh, come, oh, I'm come. asking you. Go to Lee. Do you want to sing, it? sing a couple of verses, Go to Lee? Yes, please. Um, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. That's the two. Okay, well, maybe we'll need to come back to this. I don't have it in front of me um, on the phone, but if you want to try it, Sherry, please. Okay, well, Sherry, maybe you, you will do, do it for tomorrow, maybe. Okay, or, I'll do it for tomorrow. with Or for Facebook. So yeah. one more for today. Let's go to, is Kohenet Judith Hollander with us today? Waking without a director, love that. Judy, are you here? Uh, yes, 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 okay, yes. Okay, you're up. Yes, I'm up. Okay. Well, Judy, you know that Harold's pet peeve is seeing people's ceiling fans. Well, no, only when they're moving. We're okay here. Yeah. <laughs> I'll read the I'll read the English first and then the Hebrew. Um, quaking without a director, the fool looks into her heart with dismay, but no God looks back. If God were, then why this? I am alone with blood where it shouldn't be. Am I being devoured from within or is it nothing? Overwhelmed with dread, without refuge, I wait for good news. Now here comes the Hebrew. And I have to thank Yael because she helped me with some of the words so I didn't have the wrong homonym. Charada beli minatseach, Hanaval mebabit, mebita beleva, behaz charada, Aval Elohim lo mabit, behazara, Imyesh Elohim az lama, Ani levadi, Dam shelo be makomo, Haem ani nitrefet. Mabifnin, O Shazelo Klum, Hamoma Mifakad, Lelo Miklat, Ani Mechaka, Lechadashot Tovot. Amazing! This might be our first psalm done, personal psalm done in Hebrew. Well, Mazel Tov, it's a Shechianu. Fantastic, Judy. Thank you. Well, it was a, it was a translation as opposed okay. to writing it in Hebrew. All right. Well, it's a first step. And listen, maybe some of our Hebrew speakers will consider the, doing them in Hebrew. That would be great. Yeah, and okay. yeah, help help me because some of the words you don't it's know. It's all if you're teamwork. Speak. Teamwork yeah. is good. And it's not easy. <laughs> it's not as easy as it looks. Okay. So talk to us. Well, I have a medical problem and I was dealing with it quite well. And um, when this Psalm came up, I thought, well, 
I just sat there and I thought, well, this is the only thing in my life that's really irritating me at this moment. Um, and so I just wrote about it and it sort of just, um, it worked. And um, well, at the first, the the first version, from within. go ahead, sorry. The first version went to line five and then my second column was from the Psalm itself in English and I crossed out part of line five and line six. So visually you would see there was no, I went to, there was no, what do you call it? No fulcrum. There uh -huh. was no pivot uh -huh. point. There was only not good. But only then I, um, when I read Fisher's um, last week, it was like, oh, I don't have to be optimistic and I don't have to do that, but I can, there was something that clicked when I read Fisher that allowed me to do line six and that changed my focus. Well, great. And I love that line six is its own line. Yeah. I like that that's, it's, that's, the, that's the coda and that's its own line and it stands there. And the other, also the other very, very short three word line is I am alone and four good news. Those are the two shortest with the, both three words, very powerful. Just to look at those two lines, I am alone for good news. It kind of says it all, right? Mm-hmm. And for I like that. So the, whole devoured, the whole devoured image being with blood where it shouldn't be. Am I being devoured from within or is it nothing? Yeah. And it's interesting to me that I've been able to do this because I, I define myself as like totally left brain, but there must yeah. be something else going. <laughs> there must be something else. Up something here. else is seeping in. Beautiful, Judy. Really, really beautiful. And I like the, I also like the superscription quaking without a director. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. So, Annika, we did it. We got through everybody who needed to read today because they won't be here tomorrow. Um, and a few people who were able to read either day. So tomorrow- this is the beginning of our new process. This is our how we're going uh, yes. to roll now. And I hope nobody felt rushed. I think we gave everyone time for their reading and back and forth. Um, so. Tomorrow, as the rabbi said, we will be gathering at 8.45 instead of 9.45, and we'll be able to complete the rest of the offerings. Thank you so much for uh, keeping to our uh, schedule. <clears throat> and then Wednesday, we will go into Hevruta, correct, Rabbi? Yes. For Psalm 15, and we have distributed all of the Psalm 15 texts. Thank you very much to Lori Kroatman, who spent some time over a hot scanner this weekend, scanning many of the texts for us. And then Thursday, we will go to your teaching on the Hebrew English. So for Wednesday, for anyone who's not going to be here tomorrow, please print out that Hebrew English text with that translation, because we found that some people last time didn't have that one, and it made it a little difficult for their Hebruta. Um, so uh, I also see a lot of people here who are here for our Learner's Minion on Saturday, which I how think- did it go? Oh, yeah, I'm eager to hear how it went, but I heard from Harold, but I'm so happy that it happened. Let's hear from someone else who's not Harold. Yes, yeah, somebody who's uh, not Harold. Who was there? Donna Gray, you raised your hand. I absolutely loved it. I found it so moving. Um, understanding more, um, and it's, um, both Marissa and Sam did just a beautiful, beautiful job. Donna, excuse me for stopping. I just want to say something about her name. First of all, she's Rabbi James in the synagogue. I know many people know her from before. But if you are to say her first name, she really doesn't like it when it's not pronounced correctly. So her first name is Marisa. Like take the name Risa and it's Marisa. It's not Marissa. And she- I'm gonna go back to Rabbi James. Okay, but if you were to say Marisa, it's Marisa, not Marissa. Okay, everybody, we have to practice how people want their names said. But go ahead, Donna. But Thank you, you. thank you for that. I've always said it wrong. Um, and I knew her before she was. Aware. Right. And I know it's awkward, but just, well, in her role at CBSD, she's Rabbi James. I'm going to stick to that Thank from you. now on. Thank you. So it was just so moving to me. I mean, I think I can honestly say that I was the most invested in a service ever. Fantastic. Because it made sense to me and uh -huh. everything was explained and it felt it, you know, I could really live the service. So I was so appreciative of it. I loved it. You know, for those who weren't there, could you just say a word about what it was? We're assuming everybody knows what it was, but just. Um, it so was, it was periodically. Mm -hmm. It was um, uh, advertised as the 
a beginner's um, service for the people who are new to it to learn about how it is laid out and what the different prayers mean. And um, uh, it, it, was, it was really wonderful. And I think even for people who are, you know, very steeped in Jewish lore, um, it, was, it was moving also. It was a wonderful service. I absolutely loved it. Um, I will just say that it was, I'm just gonna make a tiny distinction between learners and beginners because there were a lot of people I saw there who regularly come to the Saturday morning service who still found it so useful. I think that to be Jewish is to always be learning. Right. And um, there was something for everybody. Jack, I saw your hand go up. Did you want to give us some input? I, I will, um, I'm unmuted. You're unmuted, you're fine. Okay. I just want to ditto everything Donna said. It was really great. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm hooked uh, for that for that service every. I'm not a, a real regular on the Saturday morning, but this one was should not be missed. It, there was a question, Rabbi, about it. I I know it was recorded because I saw the little blinking light. I don't know whether we regularly post the Saturday morning services, but this one, if we could, there were a lot of people who wanted either who were there and wanted to go over it again, or who weren't there and wanted to know if they could play it. Back. Yeah, we don't usually post them, but we should certainly post this one, and I'll check into it. Jesse handles all of that. Jesse is our uh, recording and website guru. Uh, all recordings, um, and another uh, pitch that the people who had the physical C door, I think, had a better experience than those who were working off of the PDF. If you are a CBST member, um, we have gently used copies of Sidur Kol Han Shema, which is the Sidur we used. There's also, I believe, still a discount to buy your own Lev Shalem. And there is support available to anyone who can't um, afford it to get all of the Sidurim, including, of course, um, Bechol Avavcha, which everybody who has anything to do with CBST should have. So um, you can contact the office. And just one last one last thing for me, I got this, Santa brought me this book, um, The Bible With and Without Jesus, which several people in chat said they've already read. It has a wonderful beginning introduction about the difference between New Testament, Tanakh, Christian Bible, etc. I'm going to scan the introduction and send it to the rabbi, and if she approves it, I will share it with everybody because I think it's a wonderful sort of in-depth explanation of what we've been discussing with some confusion as to what is included in each of those different um, scriptures. Great. And with, that, with that, Rabbi, any last words of wisdom before we- Nothing uh... for today, looking forward to tomorrow. Let me see everybody at 8.45ish, and then we'll start class at nine. And Psalm 15 is one of the very short ones. Our shortest Psalm, I think in the entire book is four verses. This one is five verses. So it's, we're getting, there are, a few very short ones, four to six are our collection of the short Psalms. And this one has five verses. So it's a pretty short one. And uh, I think everyone will, will be moved by it also, quite different than the one we're doing right now. All right, uh, so that ends the formal portion. I see two hands up, Shep and Dorothy, but everyone else, this, those will just be questions. Everyone else can go, have a wonderful day. Yeah, and tonight, tonight is the second class of Ariel and oh, yes. class. <laughs> Uh, I think it's at six o'clock or five thirty. I don't six remember. O'clock, six o'clock. Six o'clock. Beyond the binary. And uh, I can't folks, are it enough. the last class has been recorded in a really interesting exploration of uh, bi the binary and creation stories in Judaism by our two trans rabbi and cantorial students on CBST staff. So that's tonight at six. Terrific. And Dorothy, I see your hand up. If you had a quick question. I do, Harold. Could you post those uh, books that you said were essential? You, you know, know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send next time I send it. I'm going to send an email with all the information because everybody. Great. Thank you. It. And we had a few questions in chat. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Is Ruthie Berman there? Ruthie? Michael. Yeah, you asked me to email you today's text. I don't have your email address.
Uh, hold 